Now we're going to begin the second section talking a little bit more about pressure. Another way to express pressure in addition to force per unit area is a combination of the mass density, gravity, and height of the column of fluid. So in this case pressure is equal to the mass density times gravity times the height of the fluid. And we express it this way to allow us to do some additional calculations uh, involving the pressure, density, and height of a, uh, an amount of fluid. So for example, if you have a container such as this, the bottom of this container supports the entire weight of the fluid that's in it. There are no shear forces on the sides of the container, so the vertical sides do not exert any upward force on the, on the fluid, and the bottom must support it all. So the weight of the fluid, which is expressed as the mass times the gravity, is supported by the large area, and the weight being the force, and the area being what it is, then the pressure on the bottom would be the weight divided by the area. The volume of this material is thus the area times the height, and you can see by a, a few manipulations that you end up with the idea that pressure is going to equal to the mass times gravity times the height of the fluid. So if you have a dam, the dam must withstand the force exerted against it by the water it retains. Now it's kind of interesting when you look at the dam that they are always built this way. That is, the bottom of the dam is much wider than the top of the dam. And it makes sense because if you look at the pressure against the dam at any point, it's going to be equal to the height of the fluid at that point. And so down at the bottom, the pressure and thus the force at the bottom is going to be great, much greater than at nearer to the top. And the average is going to be equal to the average height divided, uh, times the force involved. So you can see that the pressure on the, the average pressure on the dam throughout is the average height divided by or times the density times gravity. But at the bottom it's going to be the full height times the density times gravity, and at the top it'll be zero. There's no pressure at the top of this, this amount of water. And when you think about air pressure, actually what you're looking at is an enormous column of air, which is one cubic meter, square meter in area, but it has an extreme height, and thus the atmospheric pressure turns out to be 1.01 .01 times 10 to the fifth newtons per square meter or 1.01 .01 times 10 to the fifth pascals since you have this enormous column of air that is one square meter in diameter. So let's look at some problems taking these um, issues into account. The first problem says Water towers is what that's supposed to say, not what towers, but water towers store water above the level of consumers for times of heavy use, eliminating the need for high-speed pumps to pump water. How high above the user must the water be in order to create a gauge pressure of 3 times 10 to the fifth newtons per square meter if the density of water is 1,000 kilograms per cubic meter. Well, first of all, in order to do this problem, we have to get the new formula, which is pressure is equal to rho g h. And what we want to know here is what h is. So h is equal to the pressure divided by rho g. Here the pressure is that we want is 3 times 10 to the fifth Rho is a thousand and G is 9.8 meters per second squared. Do the math here and you get 30.6 meters high. So in order for them to have a 
a gauge pressure that they want, which is three times 10 to the fifth pascals, they have to have a, a water tower that's 30.6 meters above the consumers. Now let's take a look at this second question. What is the pressure on the bottom of a 0.5 by 0.9 gas tank that holds 50 kilograms of gasoline by mass? when it is full and the, and the density of gasoline is 0 0.68 kilograms per meter cubed. So first of all, we know that pressure is equal to force divided by area. Area here is going to be the length times the width, which is 0 0.9 times 0 0.5 or 0 0.45 meters squared. So pressure is going to equal force which is 50 kilograms of gasoline times 9.8 to change that into newtons divided by 0 0.45 meters squared. The, dens the giving the uh, density here was unnecessary and made an unnecessary complication. So if you do the math here you're going to get a pressure of 1089 newtons per meter squared or pascals would be the other appropriate unit here. Okay, let's now move on to talk about Pascal's principle. As I said before, a general statement of Pascal's principle is that a force exerted on any closed fluid is distributed equally throughout in that fluid. So a change in pressure applied to an enclosed fluid is transmitted undiminished to all portions of the fluid and to the walls that contain the fluid or of the contained. So a force exerted over an area is proportional to a second force exerted over an second area. So the force is the force on the first surface and the area is the area of the first surface. The second surface is the force and then lastly the area of the second surface. And this diagram illustrates exactly what we're talking about. First of all notice that this is an enclosed fluid. There's no places for the fluid to leak out. And the walls of the container have to be strong enough to withstand any force that would be applied. So this is a hydraulic system and it is two fluid filled cylinders both of which are capped by pistons that can move and it's filled by a fluid and they're connected to each other by what's known as a hydraulic line. If you make a downward force of F1 on the left piston this creates a pressure that's undiminished in any way transmitted throughout all the fluid throughout all its parts. This results in an upward force on the second piston and because the area of the second piston is larger, the force is also larger. So let's do a couple problems with that in mind. First of all, you've all been in a dentist chair before and you know that frequently you get in the chair and they pump a pedal or they do something else and you're lifted up in the air. So a dentist chair uses Pascal's principle. So let's say that the chair and the patient have a mass or force of 2,269 newtons. And the chair is attached to a large piston so it, the area of this piston is 1,221 square centimeters. To move the chair, a pump is used that it applies the pressure to a second piston whose area is 88.12 centimeters squared. So the question obviously is how much force do you have to apply here? So F1 over A1 is equal to F2 over A2. If you rearrange this, F2 is going to equal F1A2 over A1. And that's going to equal 
2269 times 88.12 divided by A1, which is 1221, and that equals 163.7 newtons. The second problem, something else that commonly happens is that some people have hydraulic jacks that they use to lift their car up to change tires or to do other work on their car. In this case, the first force is going to be 7,468 newtons over an area of 28.27 square centimeters. And the second area is 1325 square centimeters. So what is the second force? We can just use this formula again because this is a very similar situation. So it's going to be F1A2 over A1. And this is going to be 7468 times A2, which is 1.325, divided by 2827. And that's going to equal 350 newtons. So in both these cases, you can see a fairly large mass is lifted by a fairly small exertion. And that's the way these hydraulic systems work. Now we're going to talk about Archimedes' principle. Archimedes' principle is a principle that explains a concept known as buoyancy. So the pressure due to the weight of a fluid increases as the depth increases. And you understand that. And what you can see here is the pressure from the fluid that's on top of the object that's dis that is sunk in this fluid is less than the pressure that is on the bottom. So F1 is always going to be less than F2. And because of this, and the difference between F1 and F2 is what's known as the buoyant force. All the horizontal forces that may occur because of the fluid cancel each other out. So the only difference is the difference between the bottom and the top. So in A, we have an object submerged in a fluid. And because of the difference between the top and the bottom, we have what's known as a buoyant force, which is labeled F sub B. If F sub B it happens to be greater than the weight of the object, the object will rise and float. On the other hand, if F sub B is less, the object will still sink, but its weight in the fluid will be less than the weight in air. Once the object is removed, the fluid will replace it, and that fluid will have the same weight as the amount of fluid that was displaced. This is the uh, supporting fluid that has caused the buoyant force. So the buoyant force must equal to the weight of the fluid that's displaced. Therefore, Fb is equal to the weight of the fluid that's displaced or the volume of fluid that's displaced by the object. And this is what is another way or a means of stating Archimedes' principle. This is what's known as a hygrometer. A hygrometer is used to measure the density of fluids. And it, it has an, a, a specific amount of lead in its bottom that causes it to float upright. And this amount of lead combined with the weight of the actual hygrometer and the air inside causes it to have a certain density. And therefore, when it sits in a particular fluid, it will float to a specific level and that level is calibrated such that it shows the density or specific gravity of the fluid that can be read directly from the object, from the hygrometer. We will stop at this point, and the third section we will continue our discussion on Archimedes' principle, and we will also work some problems with Archimedes' principle 
um, as well as a discussion of surface tension and capillary pressure.